Chapter 10, odd number problems, 9 through 15. Number 9, two separate samples, each with n equal to 15 individuals, receive different treatments. After treatment, the first sample has sum of squared deviations equal to 1,740, and the second has sum of squared deviations equal to 1,620. Find the pull variance for the two samples. So we're going to calculate pull variance. Our pull variance equation is equal to SS1 plus SS2 over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. And since um, each sample is 15, so they're equal in size, degrees of freedom 1 would equal 15 minus 1, and that gives us 14. Degrees of freedom 2, 15 minus 1, and we get 14. So now we have all the variables that we need to replace um, them in this equation. So SS1, 1,740 plus SS2, 1,620, over degrees of freedom 1, 14, plus degrees of freedom 2, also 14. So in our calculators, if we enter 1,740 plus 1,620, and divide that by 14 plus 14, which would be 28, we get 120. So the pool variance is equal to 120. Now given that information, we can now move on to B, which says compute the estimated standard error of the sample mean difference. So in B, we're going to calculate standard, estimated standard error of the mean difference, S sub M1 minus M2 is equal to the square root of our pooled variance over N1 plus our pooled variance over N2. Let's replace variables. We have pooled variance equal to 120. N for our first sample is equal to 15. Pooled variance over N2 is 15. Again, remember in this case, just by coincidence, we have equal sample sizes. That isn't always the case, which is why it's necessary to calculate pooled variance. Um, let's see here, if we, we take these as separate fractions, um, I believe 120 in our calculator is 120 divided by 15 is equal to 8, so 8 plus 8, we'll move over here, um, 8 plus 8 is 16, so we're looking for the square root of 16, and that's equal to 4. So we have our estimated standard error um, of the mean difference, and we have our pooled variance, and given those values, we can proceed to C, which says, let's go ahead and calculate our t-statistic um, and draw our conclusions regarding the null. C says, if the sample mean difference is equal to 8 points, is this enough to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a significant difference for a two-tailed test at the 0 0.05 level? So again, we're conducting a t-test for independent sample means. Initially, we were told two different samples were exposed to two different treatments, and now we want to determine if the difference between those samples is large enough for us to say um, that the difference is due to treatment and not simply due to sampling error or chance. So we're going to calculate our t-statistic. Our t is equal to the mean difference for our samples minus the representation of the null hypothesis that says these populations are equal to one another, so the um, mu1 minus mu2, and then that's all over, again, our standard um, equation of estimated standard error, in this case of the mean difference. Okay, so let's replace what we have. Um, T is equal to, and they told us the mean difference, the sample, see here, um, it says sample mean difference is equal to 8 points. So they're not telling us what M1 or M2 um, are equal to, they're simply telling us what the difference is equal to. So they've already calculated that for us. 
so it's equal to 8. This here always represents the null. comes from the null. And always equals 0. Right, because the null says these populations are equivalent to one another, so there um, is no difference between the two. So that's always equal to zero. And then we calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference in the previous page, and that was equal to four. So now we have a t statistic equal to two. We're going to determine if that's statistically significant. To do so, we're going to need to figure out what our critical t is equal to. And to do so, we're going to need our degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom, in this case, again, we're doubling everything because we have two separate independent samples. Um, it's degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. And we had um, determined that on the previous page. Each sample was equal to 15. So degrees of freedom for both uh, was 14. So 14 plus 14 gives us 28. Uh, we're going to use a two-tailed test at alpha at 5% to find out what our critical t is equal to in our t distribution. Okay, we're in our t distribution. We have degrees of freedom equal to 28. Uh, we're going to conduct a two-tailed test, so we're going to use this tier at 5%, and so we're just going to see where those two things intersect. get a critical t equal to 2.048 plus or minus positive negative because it's a two-tailed test. We're going to use that to draw our conclusion. Okay, so given what we just did, we con concluded that our critical t is equal to 2.048 and now we're going to use that to set our critical region. In the center is the mu um, 1 minus mu 2, and that's equal to 0, that there is no difference if we took sample, excuse me, population average 1 minus population average 2, subtracted those, we'd get a difference of 0, meaning that they're equal to one another. We set our parameters at negative 2.048 and positive 2.048, so we've established our critical region. Okay, so if our t statistic falls here or here, we get to reject the null. If it falls in the other area, then we fail to reject the null. So let's see again where our t was. Our t was equal to 2, so given this number line, where would that fall? And it's just, just shy of falling into the critical region, but it's not significant enough that the difference isn't large enough for us to conclude that the difference we saw of eight points was due to treatment. Um, so here again, I like to say we're, we're sad and we don't get to reject the null. So we fail, in this case we would fail to reject the null. And also we would recognize that means the probability the probability of obtaining a t-statistic equal to 2, given the mean difference between the samples, is greater than our alpha, greater than our alpha. And so again, that's um, indicating that the t was not large enough to fall in the critical region, and therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right, number 11, for each of the following, assume that the two samples are obtained from populations with the same mean. Again, that's indicating the um, null, saying mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0, or another way of uh, understanding is mu1 is equal to mu2. And calculate how much difference should be expected on average between the two sample means. So again, essentially that they're just rewording our definition of our estimated standard error of the mean. You need to get used to them um, you know, being asked to calculate these statistics without them being as explicit as we're used to. So they're no longer always going to say calculate the estimated standard error, the mean difference. They may just give you the definition. So you have to understand what 
the estimated standard error of the mean difference is equal to. It's the expected or average difference between the two sample means. So that's what we're calculating. And they, they give us an A sample. Um, each sample has equal size of 4 with variances of 68 for the first sample and variance of 76 for the second sample. Note, because the two samples are the same size, the pooled variance is equal to the average of the two sample variances. So in this case, since they gave us variance instead of sum of squared deviations, I'm going to use the alternate equation that was presented in a previous video to calculate pooled variance. Because again, ultimately what this question is asking for is, what is the estimated standard error of the mean difference? Um, to, to calculate that, we need pooled variance. We're going to need our pooled variance. So let's calculate pooled variance. So again, this is the alternate equation um, that was presented previously. And it's equal to degrees of freedom for our first distribution multiplied by variance for our first distribution added to degrees of freedom for our second distribution multiplied by variance for our second distribution. And all that over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. So again, our other equation was SS1 plus SS2 over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. But since they gave us variance, right, then we should use the this equation um, instead. All right, so let's just replace variables. We know that n is equal to 4. Each sample is equal to 4 individuals. So degrees of freedom would equal 3. So degrees of freedom for our first sample, 3. Variance for our first sample, 68. Added to degrees of freedom for our second sample, also 3. Multiplied by the variance of our second distribution, which is 76 over degrees of freedom 1, which is 3, and degrees of freedom 2, which is also 3. So now we have everything we need to calculate our pooled variance. <clears throat> so 3 times 68 gives us 204, and then 3 times 76 gives us 228, over 3 plus 3 is equal to 6. So in our calculators, 228 plus 204 divided by 6 oops, divided by 6 is equal to 72. So we have our pooled variance for our two distributions given variance and sample size for each sample. Now we're going to use that to calculate our estimated standard error um, of the mean difference. So using this equation up here at the top, so I'm just going to replace variables again. I'm using this equation now. So the estimated standard error of the mean difference is equal to our pulled variance, which is 72, over n1 equal to 4 plus 72 over 4 and 2. Their samples are of equal size. Okay, if we take them as separate fractions, 72 divided by 4 in our calculators are equal, is equal to 18. 72 divided by 4, 18. So we're looking for the square root of 18 plus 18, which is 36, and we get 6. So what did we just solve? What we anticipate, if the null is true, again, the null states that mu1 is equal to mu2, or if we want to think of it another way, mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0. So if that mean difference according to the null is equal to 0, we anticipate that if we take samples it's not always going to be equal to the population, so the expected difference or the average difference between the two sample means if the null is true is equal to 6 points. So it kind of gives us a sense of 
you know, we know that it's not always going to be equal to zero because of sampling error or chance. And so this gives us an average difference that we would anticipate, again, if the null is true. And we're going to use that um, to go on to the next part of this um, problem for number 11. 11b. So now what we've changed is each sample now has um, 16 individuals or 16 scores with the variance of 68 and the variance of 76 for a second sample. So those variances remain the same. What we're changing is sample size. And again, we're going to calculate the estimated standard error of the mean difference and um, see if there's an effect having, the, uh, having increased sample size from 4 to 16. So again, we're going to calculate, ultimately, the estimated standard error, the mean difference. But to do so, we need our pooled variance. So we're going to calculate that. So our pooled variance, again, um, using the equation that utilizes variance, our equation is degrees of freedom 1 multiplied by our variance of our first distribution added to the degrees of freedom 2 multiplied by the variance of our second distribution over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. All right, so we're going to replace variables. So we know that now that n is equal to 16, degrees of freedom will equal 15. So 15 multiplied by the variance of our first sample, which is 68, it's a given, um, added to degrees of freedom for our second distribution, which is also 15, multiplied by the variance of our second distribution, which is equal to 76, all over degrees of freedom 1, which is 15, and added to degrees of freedom 2, which is also 15. Okay, so now that we have this, we can do our calculation so we'll carry it over here. So 15 multiplied by 68 is 1,020. Added to 15 multiplied by 76 gives us 1,140. Over 15 plus 15 is 30. And so now we can take 1,020 plus 1,140 and divide that by 30. And we get 72. And now we're going to use that to calculate our estimated standard error um, of the mean difference. So we're just going to replace these variables up here. So we have our pooled variance of 72 over 16 plus 72 over 16. Okay, so if we approach these as separate fractions, we get 72 over 16. That's equal to 4.5 plus 4.5 is equal to the square root of 9. The square root of 9 is equal to 3. So the estimated standard error, so I'll write it down here, final answer, estimated standard error of the mean difference, in this case, given sample size increases 16, is now equal to 3. It's now equal to 3. Now in the last part of this question, we're asked to consider um, or explain the effects of a larger size, um, a larger so sample size for each of our samples. So B C says in part B, the two samples are bigger than part A, but the variances are unchanged. How does sm um, sample size affect the size of the standard error of the sample mean? So what did we see the effect to be? So as N increased, estimated standard error decreased, decreased. So we had a smaller um, estimated standard error of the mean difference. On the previous page it was equal to 6 and now it's equal to 3. And we can take this one step further and also assess what the effects will be on t. 
as n increases, s to mean standard error decreases, and our t, t statistics, is going to increase. Larger t's mean um, larger or greater likelihood of rejecting the null hypothesis. Number 13, a researcher conducts an independent measure study comparing two treatments and reports the T statistic as T, in parentheses, is always degrees of freedom, equal to 2.071. So again, given that we, are, um, we understand in parentheses is degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom is equal to 25. A says, how many individuals participated in the entire study? So again, for independent measures t-test, we know that degrees of freedom is equal to n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1. So let's replace what we know and then see if we can figure out how many individuals participate in the entire study. So there, we know that degrees of freedom is equal to 25. That's equal to... And then we'll group things together, n1 plus n2 minus 1 minus 2, because we're going to do that twice. And so now to figure out what the total um, sample size is across both samples, we're just going to add 2 here and add 2 here. So we get 27 is equal to n1 plus n2. Now we don't need to know what each sample size is equal to. All we need to know is how many participate in the ent entire study. So we know that N1 plus N2 is equal to 27, meaning that takes care of the sample size for both distributions. So again, remember that when you have final um, statistics reported like this, what's in the parentheses indicates the degrees of freedom for the test that you have performed. Next, we're going to use a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05 to find our critical T and determine if there's a significant difference between the two treatment conditions. So for critical T, we're going to use our T distribution using degrees of freedom of 25, two-tailed test at alpha at 0 0.05. Okay, so our degrees of freedom, 25, we're going to use two-tailed test, that second tier at 0 0.05, and we're going to see where they meet up. And we get critical T of 2, positive, negative, 2.060. So our critical T, given our T distribution is positive, negative, 2.060. All right, we're going to draw our distribution at our critical region using the critical T. So we have negative 2.060 and positive 2.060. Again, we've just defined what the critical region looks like. We hope our T statistic falls in that region so we can reject the null. We'll make that determination in just a second. And again, we were given our um, T statistic up here at the top over here. We have our T value of 2.071. So where does that reside in our distribution given this, uh, again, the null is in the center and T is equal to zero, no difference between the two samples. So we're gonna take that value and plot it here. And we see that it barely passes the test, but nonetheless, it is in the critical region. It falls um, to the right of 2.060 because it's equal to 2.071. So we're happy here. We get to reject the null. So again, we get to reject the null. And now the probability of obtaining a t-statistic of 2.071 is less than our alpha less than our alpha because it fell into the critical region. Um, there's a less likelihood, um, the likelihood, excuse me, of obtaining that t-value if the null is true is less than a 5% chance. All right, so the next thing we're going to uh, calculate is our effect size statistic r-squared, the percentage of change um, due to treatment. So our equation is t-squared over t-squared plus degrees of freedom. 
So now we know what our t statistic is equal to. That was a given. It's equal to 2.071. We're going to square that over 2.071 squared added to our degrees of freedom, which we were also given, is equal to 25. Okay, so our numerator, if we square our t value, if we round three digits right of the decimal, we get 4.289, and then 4.289 added to 25 gives us 29.289. And now in our calculators, 4.289 divided by 29.289, we get something We get 0 0.146, 146. and what does that mean? What, how would we explain that? Well, in this case, we would say 14.6% of the difference in scores is due to treatment. So we weren't giving the sample means for this particular um, example. We were just giving our T statistic. But if we had that information, we could um, then express this. Again, if the sample mean 1 minus sample mean 2 produced a difference, then we would say 14.6% of that difference is as a result of the fact that they received different treatments. Number 15, researchers investigated the influence of background noise on classroom performance for children aged 10 to 12. In one part of the study, calming music led to better performance on an arithmetic task compared to, no music, to a no music condition. Suppose, suppose that a researcher selects one class of 18 students who listen to calming music each day while working on arithmetic problems. A second class of 18 serves as a control group with no music. Accuracy scores are measured for each child and the average for students in the music condition is equal to 86.4 with SS equal to 1550 compared to an average of 78.8 with SS equal to 1204 for students with the no music condition. Is there a significant difference between the two music conditions? Use a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0.05. So I'm going to model this one from beginning to end and start with the uh, research null and uh, the research and null hypothesis. So the null says that the music will not have an effect. on math performance. And the populations, right, so those who listen to the music, population one, is equal to the second population. Those, so those who listen to music, their performance is going to equal those who do not listen to music. So another way we can write this is if we take population 1 minus population 2, that difference will equal to 0. So again, denoting that they're equivalent to one another. The research hypothesis says that the music will have an effect on math performance. And therefore, if we take population, we would understand that population 1 is not equal to population 2. Those who listen to music are different than those who do not. Or we can think of population 1 minus population 2 is not equal to 0. So there's a difference. Now, I know that sometimes students will want to say, well, I want to conduct a one-tailed test because they said they performed better, better performance. But please um, follow the instructions, even though they're stating what the previous researchers had concluded in their 2002 um, research report. 
And here we're told our instructions are to conduct a two-tailed test. So the two-tailed test will always have this kind of notation where it's equal to in the null and not equal to in the research hypothesis. So now to test significance, we're going to um, need to figure out what our critical t value is. So we're going to need our degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is equal to n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1. And that's equal to, so first sample, um, we had 18 individuals. So minus 1 plus 18 minus 1. And if we take um, 17 plus 17, we get 34 as our degrees of freedom. We're going to find our critical T using our degrees of 34, degrees of freedom 34, two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05 in our t, t table. Okay, in our T distribution, again, degrees of freedom or equal to 34. And notice over here, we don't have 34, but in a previous um, uh, chapter video, I explained you know, how to determine which value to enter using. So the degrees of freedom, we're going to go with the lower value. Um, and the reason, again, is it produces a higher um, critical T, which makes our test more conservative. So again, our choices were between 30 and 40. We're going to go with 30, not because of rounding rules, but because of this idea that lower degrees of freedom are going to have higher critical T values and therefore produces a more conservative value. We're going to use two-tailed test at 5%. And we're going to find where those two values intersect, and we get 2.042. Two point zero four two positive negative because it's a two-tailed test, and now we're going to use that to draw our conclusions. Well, actually, we have to do a little bit more, um, but here we establish the critical region for our test. Okay, so we found that our critical t is equal to two point zero four two positive or negative, and now we're going to engage in all of the um, calculations to produce a, a t statistic to draw comparison. So we're continuing with the same example. Um, now what we need to do is calculate our t statistics. So t is equal to the sample mean difference minus the population mean difference. Again, that's coming from the null, always equal to 0, over estimated standard error of the mean difference. And let's go ahead and replace the values that we know. We know that the sample mean, um, but our first sample mean was 86.4. Again, those are givens on the previous page from our um, um, problem, minus 78.8. So 86.4 was generated from those who listened to the music, 78.8 generated from those who did not listen to the music. And this is always represent, uh, representative of the null, it's equal to zero. And so what we notice, what we don't have, is estimated standard error of the mean difference, which we will calculate in just a second. Over here, I'm going to set my parameters given the t statistic, the critical t that we um, just found in our t table. So we have a critical t set at negative 2.042. And positive 2.042 and again we just set the critical region for our test and to draw our conclusions we're going to have to finish our calculations so um, to calculate the estimate standard error of the mean difference we're going to need pooled variance and that's equal to SS1 plus SS2 and Again, we're using this equation because SS values were given, opposed to the previous example where we used variance. And then that's going to be over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. We'll replace variables. Again, this is coming from the given information. SS1 is equal to 1550 
plus SS2, 1,204 degrees of freedom for our first distribution. Our samples were equal to 18 for both. So this would be 17 plus 17. Okay, so in our calculators, 1,550 plus 1,204 gives us 2,754 over 17 plus 17, 34. So on your calculators, we'll do this calculation, 2,754 2, divided by 34 gives us 81. So the pooled variance is equal to 81. We're going to now use that to calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference. What we would expect sample 1 minus sample 2 to equal if the null were true. And our equation is equal to the square root of our pooled variance over n1 plus pooled variance over n2. We're going to replace variables. We get 81. Our sample size, again going back to the givens, is equal to 18 plus 18, excuse me, oops, transpose numbers, 81 over 18. Okay, so if we take 18, excuse me, 81 divided by 18, we get 4.5 plus 4.5. I understand that these have the common denominators and we could simply add the numerators and divide by the addition of the denominators. I refrain from doing that simply because our um, sample sizes aren't always going to be equal. So I, I try to approach them as different fractions separate from each other. Um, but you could obviously do it in the other manner if, if indeed you do have a common denominator. So we have um, 4 plus 4.5 plus 4.5 is equal to 9. Square root of 9 is equal to 3. So now we have our denominator of our t equation. So and that's equal to 3. So now we have what we need to calculate our t statistic. So we take the mean difference, which is 86.4 minus 78.8, and divide by 3 to get our t statistic equal to. 2.53 and now given that we compare it um, to our distribution over here to see where it resides in relation to the set parameters of the critical t value so where does this fall it's a positive number and it would actually fall into the critical region makes us happy right we know that that enables us to reject reject the null and um, rejecting the null means that our probability, the probability of obtaining that t statistic is less than alpha, 0 0.05. Um, so we're going to go on to a couple more steps to finalize this particular problem, which will include a confidence interval and then drawing and writing our final concluding statement. Okay, so finally, we're going to compute a 90% confidence interval for the population mean difference. In other words, we're going to estimate what we anticipate the true population mean difference to equal using the sample statistic difference. Um, so we're going to calculate a range, and, and in this case, we're going to be 90% confident that the true population mean resides within this range. So our equation for calculating the true population mean difference. Our new equation for this chapter is population 1 minus population 2, that's what we're calculating as a range, is equal to the sample statistic difference, which is mean 1 minus mean 2, plus or minus a t value. And again, that's not our t statistic. It's the t value coming from the t, t table, given the percentage of confidence that we've set multiply by our estimated standard error of the mean difference. Okay, so we're going to um, find our value for t so we can replace variables. Um, and again, let's first identify what we know. So let's go back to what m1 minus m2 is equal to. So our those who listen to the music earned 86.4 on the assessment. And those who didn't earned 
78.8. So if we do that um, calculation, we'll get the mean difference for our sample, so 86.4, um, which we already did in the previous page, but nonetheless, minus 78.8, and we get 7.6. All right, so um, now we can replace some of these variables. So the range of our true population mean difference is equal to 7.6 plus or minus our t value, which we'll find in just a second, multiplied by our estimated standard error of the mean difference, and we had calculated that to equal 3. All right, so to find our t value in this equation, it's based on the percentage of confidence. So again, we're talking about calculating a range where 90% of the sample mean differences will reside. What's left over is 10%. So we're going to take that 10%, divide by 100, and get a proportion 0.1000. Um, and we're going to use that in addition to our degrees of freedom. So let's recall what our degrees of freedom for this particular example was equal to. Each sample was 18. So 18 minus 1 was 17. And for both, so degrees of freedom was 34. We established that already in the previous process. So we have degrees of freedom equal to 34. We're going to use um, the two-tailed process given that we are calculating a range of values. Again, we want to find a value here and value here. Um, so it's a two-tailed process and we're going to use 0.1 as the alpha level to find that t value. Okay, so just to point out, our original hypothesis was a two-tailed test at alpha at 5%, but now we're conducting a confidence interval at 90%. So again, we're going to use the two-tailed tier because we're calculating value um, above and below the sample statistic mean difference. And the difference between 90% and 100 is 10%, a proportion of 0.1. And our degrees of freedom, again, we're 34, but we, our rule of thumb is to use the lesser degree of freedom when we have gaps. And now we're just going to find where those two values intersect. And we get 1. 1. 1.967. 1. So we're going to use that in our, our, in our equation. So again, what we just found, our t-value for that equation um, is 1.697. I'll just set this aside. And I'm going to go and erase this here so that I can replace that value now that I know what it is. So 1.697 multiplied by 3. Again, the positive and negative is already taken care of here. So we're, we, are, um, we don't have to include it again. And the positive negative ensures that we're, we're computing a value above and below the sample statistic um, value. So I'm going to draw this over here to show you, to illustrate what we are calculating. And I'm going to erase some of this to give us a little bit more room. All right, so the mean difference given the sample statistics was equal to 7.6. So that's the default in the center. In other words, if we had access to the, um, both populations, we would anticipate this, the sample statistics to be good representations of those populations. And if we took sample 1 minus sample 2, we get a difference of 7.6. Now we want to find out, you know, 90% of the time, um, what that actual mean population mean difference would equal given this equation. So the center is set at the sample statistic mean difference. And if we do this calculation, mean 1 minus mean 2, again, our calculation is in relation to what we would anticipate the true population mean difference to equal. Um, so it's 7.6 plus or minus this product. Okay, so in our calculators, 1.697 multiplied by 3 should give us 5.091. So 
So um, we're going to take 7.6, add 5.091, and subtract it. So if we add it in our calculator, 7.6 added to 5.091, we get a value of 12.691. And if we take 7.6, subtract 5.091, we get 2.509. And what we've just calculated is that we are now stating that we're 90% confident that if we had um, the ability to assess um, both populations, those who listen to music while, conduct, um, while performing the math um, calculations versus those who do not listen to music, the mean difference between those two populations would fall within this range of values, um, 2.509 to 12.691. Again, you should ask yourself, does it include the null? The null said that the mu difference would equal zero. And luckily, within this range, we do not see zero. Zero would be, if this is a number line, zero would be over here somewhere. And that's not included in this um, calculation. So again, it gives us good reason to feel confident about rejecting the null hypothesis that if we, again, had access to both populations and able to expose them to this treatment, we would see that the population mean difference would reside within this range of 2.5 to 12.7, approximately. And again, we use the base, the center of that calculation, the basis of that, that calculation as the mean statistic, um, or the mean difference that we obtained from our sample one and sample two. So everything looks really great in terms of our confidence interval. Another way we can think of this is that if we were to take um, a sample, um, sample one, those who listen to music, minus sample two, those who don't listen to music, 90% of the time that mean difference would fall within 2.5 to 12.7. And then finally, we can write our final concluding statement. So we do know that we were able to reject the null. The null said that they would perform equally well on this math assessment if they listened to music or did not. And our results indicated that, that we could reject that idea. Um, results indicate that music had an effect on math performance we conducted a t test degrees of freedom was equal to 34 so how many total um, the total degrees of freedom for both samples our t statistic was equal to 2.53 the probability of obtaining that t value was less than alpha. And we calculated a 90% confidence interval, which was equal to confidence interval equal to 2.509 through 12.691. Close the brackets and period. And so now we've illustrated um, We've performed the entire hypothesis test and um, written our final concluding statement, which includes the statistics that are important for someone who's consuming our research, and they can understand what type of test we performed, the significance of the results that we um, obtained, and then followed with a confidence interval, giving us a sense of where the true population mean actually resides. Although this problem didn't ask for it, I'm going to go ahead and calculate um, estimated D and R squared as additional um, measures of effect. Just so you can see one problem where we um, utilize all the new equations. So our estimated D for this um, chapter is equal to the sample 1 minus sample 2 difference over the square root of our pooled variance. If we take the square root of a, a variance, that's the standard deviation. So again, similar to our equation from the previous two chapters. So the mean difference, um, again, calculated given our sample 
average one, 86.4, those who listen to music, minus the average of those who didn't listen to music. And then our pooled variance, again, these are all values that we calculated previously. Our pooled value, um, variance was equal to 81. So this is 7.6 over 9, and we get 0.84. And again, what does that tell us? Well, what we're saying is that the null says mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0 here in the center. And we found that um, given the sample difference, that was equal to um, 7.6, right? So if we consider that as a good estimate of the population difference. And the difference between here and here is 7.6, right? 7.6 minus 0 is 7.6. But now we're expressing it in standard deviation units. So this is um, 0.84 standard deviation units. In other words, the, sh the distribution of um, mean differences shifted 0.84 standard deviation units upward as a result of um, treating condition one that listened to music while they performed the math assessment. So they did better and therefore the population of mean difference shifted 0.84 standard deviation units. And then R squared is equal to t squared over t squared plus degrees of freedom. We have our t statistic of 2.53. We're going to square that over 2.53 squared plus our degrees of freedom was 34. So we get um, 2.53 squared approximately equal to 6.4. 6.4 plus 34 gives us 40.4. And if we do that calculation, we get something close to 0.158. If we round, let's say 0.16, so we're saying that 16% of the difference in scores, right, those who, who listened to the music scored this. Those who didn't listen um, to music scored an average of 78.8. So, 16% of the difference in scores is due to the treatment, meaning that um, those who listen to music, um, the reason they saw an increase in scores is because they listened to the music while they were conducting um, or completing the math assessment. So just wanted to include those. Um, again, this would be high, very high effect as well as this high effect. And we feel, again, using those it gives us a sense of, of uh, assurance that we accurately rejected the null hypothesis in this test.